Yeah, you were. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us for uh, this uh, Australian community event session. Um, we spoke with two people presenting to you on, on the next session. Um, we've got um, Cousin Ziegler and uh, David, David Boschart. Um, both of them from uh, Adobe R&D, Research and Development. Um, been involved with OCI for a, a long time. Um, David is actually uh, co-chair of the Enterprise Expert Group within the Alliance. Uh, Carsten's a board member of the Alliance, so you can complain to Carsten if you've got any problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're both very active within open source projects as well. So Carsten is PMC for Felix, yeah. Um, and heavily involved with Sling, Felix, Ace, and a whole host of other things. David's also been uh, very active in driving the cloud and OCI and cloud activities within the expert group. And uh, they're here today to talk to you about maximizing the power of OCI. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Did you say torture or talk about? Torture. <laughs> torture, right. <laughs> I got it right. Yeah, so uh, wel welcome to, to our talks. This is David, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm Carsten. As Mike already did all these introductions, we can skip all of this stuff and directly go to the interesting thing about what we are trying to present in the next uh, 55 minutes, I believe we have, right? Uh, that's a common joke here. So um, today we are, we are actually talking about three different topics. Um, the first one is declarative services. It's about how to build uh, components and services. And it's about then the uh, about the coordinator, which is a pretty interesting uh, specification in OSGI, and finally about subsystems. Right, so that's on the menu for today, and I'll start with the uh, first part, obviously, which is declarative services. Right, so um, just to to get a feeling ab about the audience, who of you knows OSGI? Oh, that's pretty good. And who of you is, is developing stuff with, with OSGI? That's a more or less the same. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> good, good. So yeah, that makes it a little bit easier for, for the introduction part because I think more or less everyone already knows OSGI. And if it comes to developing stuff with, with OSGI, or, or components and, and services with, with OSGI, you can pick different, different approaches, different component frameworks. For one, you can directly use the framework API and then do your stuff, which is the, let's say, low-level way of, of doing things. Or you can use declarative services, which we are going to talk about. But you could also use some other specifications like the Blueprint stuff or some open source implementations of, of developing components from various places. And the nice thing about OSGI is that it defines this common OSGI service registry so no matter what approach you're using, they are all registering the services in the service registry, and then they can talk to each other. So even if you have an application which uses uh, declarative services and blueprint, they, the services just work because they share the same registry. That's kind of nice. Now, um, I mean, as, as Mike said, we are doing OSGI for, for a very long time, and during this time, we saw a lot of preconceptions um, about OSGI where, where people saying, okay, it's too complicated, you can't build large applications with it, it's too slow, um, you can't do uh, just simple POJOs and, and, and all these things. And really the question is if, if that's true or not. And I mean, if that would be true, then we were probably not standing here and blaming ourselves. Um, obviously, this is not true, and we, what we try to do is, is make these things go away in the next 50 minutes, at least a little to, to some degree, and show that it's really easy to develop stuff with, with OSGI. So they will all disappear, and at, at the end, we are all happy. That's at least our goal. So just to, to um, do this, we uh, look at a little web application we've developed which is this nice um, guessing game you might be familiar with. So basically, the, the application is generating a random number in a, in a specific range, and you have to guess this number. And if your guess is too high, it says it's too high. If it's too low, it says it's too low. 
if you're correct, then it tells you as well, and then you can make the next guess based on, on the result of the previous one. It has different levels, just to specify the, the range of the number generation. Right, so if you want to do this with OSGI, your building blocks are, you develop some components, um, offer some, some services, use some other services, put this all into, into a module, in a bundle, deploy it in your system, and you're done. Of course, the hardest part is always to um, come up with a design for your application. It took me, I believe, three weeks to, to get to this design <laughs> because I couldn't think of what, what color to pick for the user on the left hand side. Okay, um, so it's a very simple design, obviously. A central service, uh, which is a game controller managing all the game logics, a servlet up front taking the request from the user, responding to it, and that's it. Um, yeah, for the design, I went even more crazy and, and developed some, some interfaces for or one interface actually for, for the game controller. You can start a game, enter the next guess, um, and find out the maximum range for, for a level. So we have an enumeration for the level and so on. The game object holds the state, but that's all not, not really important for here now. The important part is that, that we have the central service, the game controller. So the first step you do when developing this application is obviously to implement this um, service on the right hand, the game controller. And that's actually pretty simple. You just write your class, which implements the interface, add this nice component annotation, and that's all you have to do if you're using declarative services. So you build your stuff, deploy your bundle, and then you get automatically a game controller service registered in the service registry. And I think that's, it can't get easier to um, develop a service like this. When it comes to configuration, um, we want to be able to configure the ranges for the different levels. So we have three different configuration values. And there's a nice thing to do that in, in declarative services. That's by specifying uh, a configuration annotation, which is a little bit unusual. But the nice thing about using an annotation here is that you can define already default values for each configuration property you have. So we have these three different, well, that's okay. We have these three different um, configuration properties, one for each level and with these different um, default values. Now, um, the nice thing again is if you have, for example, something like, um, if you have start, so, uh, I start again, sorry. I'm a little bit confused. Now, um, obviously, if, if you're using, if you're developing OSGI applications, you store configurations for your stuff in configuration admin, right? And, and you have usually no idea um, how these values are actually stored in, in configuration admin. So for example, it could be uh, just stored as a string containing the number, it could be a long, but on the other hand, your configuration expects an integer. And if you're using this approach with declarative services, all this type conversion is automatically done for you, so you don't have to deal with all these, these different uh, situations. So once you've defined your configuration and you have this configuration um, stored in configuration admin, you want to use this configuration in your component, and you can just simply do that by writing an activate method, annotating it with that, with, with the activate annotation, and using this configuration annotation from the previous slide or shown below here um, as a parameter for, for this method. Then you can just use the actual configuration, starting configuration admin within your code. And just to give another example, that this method Z, which gives the maximum value for a level, simply use this annotation object which holds the configuration within the code. Again, this is a little bit unusual, right? Using annotations, um, especially at, at runtime and at objects of annotations at runtime, but it's really a very 
easy and handy way um, to do configurations. So we have this first part, ball is covered. We have our game controller service implemented. It is configurable through configuration admin. The second part is to write the uh, servlet, which is using the game controller service. And here we'll simply use um, another specification, which is the HDB whiteboard um, specification, which allows you to register servlets using the whiteboard pattern. And if you want to know more about this stuff, um, you can go to our session tomorrow, where we go a little bit more into detail into the HDB whiteboard service. But just for here now, if, if you want to register a servlet under the pass um, game or slash game, then you specify this property, use a comp component annotation, and register it as a servlet. And that's all you have to do. Within your code, you obviously want to use a game controller. So you need to get hold of the actual game controller service. The easiest way is just to use this reference annotation on, on the field. And when the servlet gets instantiated or actually activated, it already holds a reference to the game controller and you can just use it throughout your code and you're done. Now there are different um, types of references. This is the easiest one we've just seen here, which is a mandatory one uh, or required reference. So if there's no game controller, your servlet is not, not there, right? That's the easiest, easiest thing to do. But if you want to somehow deal with in your code that a game controller might be there or might not, and you, you can handle that case somehow, you can use um, different attributes on the, on the annotation and um, make this thing opti opti optional and then deal within your code whether it's null or not and do the um, appropriate action on, on that one. And in some cases, you want to have all the, um, all the available service for a specific type. For example, in our case, we have a different high score service for each level, so for the easy minimum and the maximum level. And if you want to have all these services, you can just annotate a collection of that service type. And then at runtime, this collection is always filled with the currently available set of, of services of this type which is quite, quite handy to do that. Sure. All oh right, yeah, yes, yes. So if, if you want to have some, let's say, yes, yes, yes. Right. So if you want to have some specific um, service or, or service implementation in that case, you can specify a filter at the reference, which basically then filters based on the, uh, on the service properties you used to register that, that one. But is, is the concept of the, the most recent version? Mm, not, not directly, no. Okay, and this is basically all you need to make your user yellow and, and, and happy. You develop your game controller, your servlet, and then use this reference annotation between it and, and you're done. And you can obviously deploy um, your stuff into an OSGI application, your, your bundle into an OSGI application. And as this is a web-based application, you can also make use of the um, Apache Felix web console, which allows you to look into, into your application, see which bundles are there and the configurations and so on. And for example, for our simple game controller service, there's uh, a configuration to specify the ranges for, for the different, different levels. And what we see here is some nice uh, descriptions and, and labels for each configuration value we, we have. But so far in our code, we didn't 
see these labels and, and descriptions. The question is now, how can you define this stuff? And this ties in with the OSGI meta type specification, where you can basically describe such configurations. And based on the configuration annotation we've seen already earlier, you can just add this meta type information. By using these different annotations, you specify the object class definition on the annotation, give it the label and description, and then you just describe each property with label and description. And this then basically makes a meta type description for this configuration thing. And then you need to tell the system that um, you want to use this meta type description for your game controller service, which is then just adding this designate annotation to, to your class. And this ties in the meta type information to your game controller service. And you can use this, game, uh, this, this meta type description like in the web console, and that's all you have to do. So this is a very quick run through the different um, pieces you have when it comes to develop stuff with, with declarative services. Um, yeah, what I wanted to show is it's really easy to use. These are POJOs, so there's no OSGI um, API used except for the annotations, which are just used at, at build time, of course. And all the dynamics and all this stuff is nicely handled for you by all these references and, and these things, and ties in nicely with, with configurations, meta type, just specify the uh, annotations in your, in your Java source code, and you're done, which I think is pretty, pretty nice and easy. For all this stuff, um, the tooling is, is already there. I mean, we, we just have this slide because this stuff is fairly new as we released the specification in September, I believe, around that time, and, but obviously all the implementations are already there tooling is there with, with BND tools, plugins for Maven, and so on, and it works pretty pretty well. That basically makes the first part um, of our talk about component development, and I guess we go directly to David right. with the con This really depends on, on which, uh, which, let's say, implementation you're using at, at runtime, which picks up these files. Um, for example, the, the famous one is, is the file install tool, which uses a properties file format. And then I think part of on, on road uh, is these JSON based things. So it really depends on what you have okay. at runtime. The OCI specs don't describe the physical format on disk of the configuration information. There's no spec for that. It, it describes the APIs, but the format is up to the implementation. For example, the Sling one is, is even different. Like the one that, the example that you had is from the Sling uh, installer, right? Where you have uh, like uh, strings and also uh, different data types. Right. Yeah. I think we had a question over there. Yeah, uh, the question was how the OCI framework finds and integrates its components and the class. Ah, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good, good question, which, which I skipped. Um, so basically, these, these annotations are build time annotations, and, and the build tool then generates um, XML files in, in this case, which are put in your, into your bundle, and then they get picked up at runtime. All right, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'll, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the OCI coordinator, which is one of the lesser uh, known uh, services in OCI, and um, I think it's, it's, it's just a, a very, very useful service um, to know a little bit about. 
So when you're building an application, um, the application performs various tasks and sometimes it can be uh, more optimal to, to group certain tasks together. And, and just you know, talking about configuration, let's say you have a system that can be configured in a number of different ways and maybe it makes sense to apply every piece of configuration first before you apply all of them because if you apply a configuration the system usually has to reconfigure itself it takes a little bit of time and um, so it can be handier to in many cases to apply all the changes first and then say okay now i'm done so so that's an example where where it can be useful to group things together um, a few other examples I put on the slide is, for example, um, to group database access calls. Uh, maybe you want to close the connection when the last uh, database access is done. Or maybe when you're using a cache, uh, you, uh, you want to flush the cache when you know that all the operations that have something to do with the cache are finished. And so combining these things is better, and that's what the, um, the OCI coordinator service allows you to do. Um, Typically you have a, a coordination, or actually always you have a coordination initiator. Um, this entity starts the coordination. Uh, it generally knows the higher level task. Um, it could even be a UI where a user actually operates on it. The user kind of enters all these configuration values and says, okay, now I'm starting, entering all the values, and now I'm finished. So, you know, do all this stuff. Um, the coordinator normally ends the, um, the, co the, 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 the initiator ends the coordination as well, but um, as part of the coordination, other entities can register themselves as participants. Uh, and the participants can also end the coordination. They can basically fail it, for example, if something goes wrong. So this very much looks like a transaction model, <laughs> as some people might have thought. Uh, it is very much like it. It's very much like a transaction system, but it's a little bit lighter weight. It doesn't have all of the guarantees that a typical transaction system has. And it's really uh, aimed at providing an optimization to whatever task you're, you're doing. Um, OK, so I put a little link down there. Um, there, there are various implementations of, of this coordinator service. I'll show a, a slide, the next slide on how you can use it. Uh, one of them is in, in uh, Equinox, and the other one is in Felix, written by Karsten, actually. Um, so you can, there's multiple implementations available. And here's a little bit on how you can use them. So there's actually two models to work with these coordinations. There's an explicit model and an implicit model. When you have an explicit model, you pass the coordination around, um, which, you know, if you design the system from scratch, that might be perfect. But if you want to use a coordination to, to optimize an existing process, that may be difficult because you already have public APIs. And like, for example, here, I have a set configurations API uh, which is public and I can't really change that API anymore. I have existing <coughs> entities calling it and I want to basically optimize the process uh, using these existing APIs. So there is also an implicit uh, coordination model where the coordination is associated with the thread context. So you can just use it uh, with your existing APIs and there's, it's even possible to combine the explicit and the implicit models together. You can take them off the transaction, uh, the thread context, pass them around and push them back on the thread context if that's what you want to do. So here's my, my example. Um, <laughs> it calls uh, set configurations, which in this example does some, not really a lot. It just prints out setting configuration data and then it flushes it. So, you know, that looks a bit like this, which is really not uh, very optimal. And um, so if I want to set all the configurations in one shot and then flush it, it would look a little bit like this. Um, but you can see that oops, the original API, that is the set configurations API, hasn't changed. Right? That is actually still the same. On the outer level, I make a different I have a different starting point. So now I say set configurations with coordinator, and that's where the coordinator service is being used. So I basically say I begin a coordination, I have to give it a name and a timeout. That gives me a coordination. But the begin keyword also puts it on the thread context. So it's like a current coordination. And now I can call my set configurations uh, as I did before. And then inside the individual set config uh, method, I add myself as a participant. Now at this level, 
I don't really know the bigger task. I don't know the bigger picture. I don't know when the whole thing is finished. Um, but I do, I want to know whether I'm part of something bigger. And that's really what happens here. The, um, in here, I ask the coordinator service, is there a current coordination? Then if so, add myself. Otherwise, I just do whatever I did before. But if there is a coordination, I just don't do anything. But I've added myself as an interested party, which means, which means that I get called back when the coordination is finished. And that happens here. So this allows me to keep the APIs as it is, have an, a higher level entity that starts the coordination, ends it, and only flush the configurations for this particular example when I know that it's ended. So that's, that's an example of how to do that. And uh, the, the um, participant didn't, didn't actually fail. There's no callbacks here to fail the coordination, but it, they can throw an exception, which could get caught here. And then the, in this case, the initi initiator can fail the, um, the coordination as well. Well, normally you don't want that, obviously. But uh, just like with real, con real transactions, anyone can fail the transaction. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And each of them registers as a participant. Yes. So yeah. wouldn't it be called 10 times? Yes. Ten times? Uh, no, because if you're already a participant, you don't get called ag uh, added again. So that's part of the, the way the API is defined. It, this is just a very simple way of do two things at the same time. Find out whether there's a current coordination, and if there is one, add yourself, but only once. Um, there are other APIs in there as well. I just wanted to pick one example that was relatively simple to, to, to implement. Any more questions about the coordinator before? OK. Um, then I'll move over to another uh, specification, which is, is just uh, very useful um, if you want to uh, take advantage of, of all the goodies that OCI uh, has to offer, and that's OCI subsystems. So. Let's say you've implemented your OCI uh, application. Uh, if you've done it right, you probably have a lot of bundles. If you only have one bundle, you've probably done it wrong, <laughs> wrong right? <laughs> you don't have your modularization uh, uh, properly done. So I think it's pretty common to have an application that has like 50 bundles or 100 bundles. Um, I mean, in, in our company, we have applications with 500 bundles. That's pretty normal, and that's totally fine. Um, except there might be one little thing that might be a bit big difficult is if you want to give your application to someone else and say, okay, you can deploy this, here's 500 bundles, that might be a little bit impractical. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you really like to kind of, you know, create a, a neat package around those bundles so that you can give the, all of them together to somebody else and they can just deploy them as one entity even though inside there's all these individual bundles. So in the past, many different uh, you know, projects came up with different solutions. Carafe had the car files. Uh, there were par files in um, what you call it, the uh, spring source. And uh, well, th there, are everybody, there were about 12 different formats uh, that solved this problem. And as of the OCI R5 specifications, there's now a standard for it, which, called, which are called subsystems. And subsystems are really, um, you know, uh, they're, they're a specification and they're really just a packaging of multiple bundles. Uh, they're put in an ESA file, which stands for Enterprise Subsystem Archive, um, which effectively is just a zip file. Now, it's actually a little bit more than a combination of all the bundles. It can also support uh, isolation models. Talk about that in, in, in the next slide. Um, you, can, you can have in isolation, but you don't have to. Um, in the ESA file, there's always a descriptor of what this subsystem is. Uh, this, the, there's basically two deployment models. You can, you can put all your bundles inside the ESA file, which means you know, it's just a big archive that has everything in there that you need. You just deploy it, and your whole application runs. But what you could also do is you could put um, the names of the bundles in your descriptor and have the deployment done over the OCI repository. So in that case, your subsystem ESA file is really very small. It's just a descriptor that points at bundles and they are then sucked in from a repository. 
You can also do something in between. You can put half of the bundles in the ESA file and the other half in the repository if, if, you, <laughs> if you fancy that. But um, I guess typically people do one or the other. OK, talking a little bit about the subsystem types. Um, this is where you, know, you decide whether you have isolation and how much. Um, there's a subsystem type called features. And these have no isolation at all. So features are really just a, a deployment vehicle. All the, the bundles inside the feature subsystem are installed in a shared space, just like they were if you installed them by yourself. And the only benefit there is that you have the one archive, and you can also start a subsystem, which means that you start all those 500 bundles in one go, rather than having to start them uh, individually. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there's applications. Uh, applications are pretty much fully isolated in the way that uh, they really are designed to get out of the way of other applications. So if you have a system where you have multiple applications running that are developed by different you know, uh, organizations in your company, for example, you don't maybe want to have them interfere. Maybe they use different versions of the same library that you haven't tested with. Or maybe they expose a service that has the same API as your system exposes, but you still don't want them to, to call each other. That's what applications are for. Nothing of your application is exported to the outside, although applications can import things to the inside if they need them and they don't provide them themselves. So you can have a shared kind of environment with loggers and maybe some other stuff. Uh, you can all have that in the shared space, and if the application needs that and it finds that it doesn't have it itself, they are automatically imported. So both features and applications are easy because they require very little configuration. They are all kind of defaulted. Um, but there might be cases where they don't do exactly what you want. Maybe you do want to export some services, but not all of them. Uh, in, this, in that case, you can have a look at um, composites. And composites are basically anywhere in between features and applications, and you can configure exactly what you export and what you import. So here's a little example of how it would work at runtime. So I've got two uh, feature subsystems here. Um, they are, look actually remarkably similar. They have the same bundles, API bundle, service bundle, and use bundle, but they also have this unique bundle that is different between them. Now, if I deploy those two subsystems at runtime, I will only get the, sh the bundles that are the same once, because they're all shared in the shared space. It reuses those bundles. It sees that they're already there, so it doesn't really deploy them again. But the bundles that are unique across the two features are both deployed. And then there's like a reference counting mechanism. So if I install this guy first, and then that guy, and then I uninstall him, then these shared bundles stick around until I've uninstalled the last one that is, uh, ooh, five minutes. Um, the last one is gone. And here's an example of a, uh, an application uh, subsystem. Now this actually shows something else. You can nest these subsystems. So this is a single ESA file that contains two other ESA files, which both are application subsystems, and they're exactly identical. But because they're applications and nothing is shared out, I get these bundles duplicated at runtime as well. So obviously less sharing. It's less efficient for memory, but you get more isolation. It's up to the, the, to the deployer to decide which model you, you like best. OK, put a little slide in here on how, how you uh, make subsystems. Um, using Maven. Now, there's not a lot of tooling yet to, to build subsystems or sausages in this case. <laughs> uh, so, but if, if you are using Maven, there's a really easy, easy plugin uh, available in Maven, the uh, Apache Arias e ESA Maven plugin, which basically turns all your dependencies into a subsystem. It's very easy. Uh, and um, so that, that's, that works pretty well. Uh, but, for example, BND Tools doesn't support uh, subsystems just yet, as far as I know, so keep uh, knocking the people there to s start supporting them. Um, if you want to, uh, to play with them at runtime, um, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can use the subsystem gogo -go command, which is um, uh, just installs into the gogo -go shell, and then you have a command line subsystem list, subsystem install kind of commands. Uh, but much nicer is the, um, the subsystem web console plugin that plugs into the web console that Karsten talked about earlier on, and then you can have an interactive 
uh, way of, of, of installing and installing starting and stopping subsystems and playing with them. It's really good to, to get started with subsystems to have a, a graphical tool, I think. I put the links down here. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, more information on uh, creating subsystems can be found in uh, the OSHA Enterprise Specs, obviously. Uh, the Apache Ares website has a page on subsystems. And if you just want to get started yourself without having to do too much work, you can check out this project, which basically has a bunch of um, subsystem, subsystems kind of pre-created that you can just build yourself and you can deploy them and see if they work. So the, the two examples with ap applications and two features that I had on the earlier slides are in there. There's a few other ones as well. And then last but not least, um, everything that Karsten and I discussed uh, is available in open source. In most cases, there's implementations both in Eclipse or in Equinox, as well as in Apache Felix or Arius. So you have, you have a lot of choice. Um, there is a, a Wikipedia page that uh, somewhere on the slides I put the link where you can see for any OCI specification where you can find implementations, both commercial and open source, just a collection. So if you're looking for an implementation of, of any of these specs, that's always a good place to go because you can see who is providing it. And with that, I guess we have a minute or two for questions. Yeah. Yes. How this configuration at the moment and targets the right one? Right. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> um, so there's, there's various ways in which you can do this. Um, configuration admin has a, a, a special way of addressing a particular bundle. If, there are more, if there's more than one bundle uh, that, prov that listens to the same configuration information. Um, so that's definitely possible, but there are also other, uh, you can also run your config admin inside that application, which means it only has visibility of, of that application. So then you have no problem at all. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a question that is not fully answered so yet. It would create a unique identifier for each configuration, for each bundle, and you could use that identifier to target a particular configuration for a bundle that is in a particular subsystem. But it's, it's uh, do you want to add something to that, Karsten? No, I think it describes <laughs> very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little bit complicated. It's not so easy. That. That's one of the things where maybe we need to do a little bit of work. So if people have ideas about this, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> so the, the one place to also point people at, there's a OSGRHBev mailing list. So if you've got questions like this, or questions about what implementations are available for that, different parts of the stack and sign up to the OSR dev mailing list. It's available on the OSR website and uh, yeah, people will be more than happy including dev and parts and are active on there. So, sorry. A any yeah. more questions? Is there an open path for a blind dog storage label or do you need to double check to do it? Um, it's a little bit different in the case of subsystems. Um, you can have within a subsystem you can have a start ordering so you can say, okay, this subsystem consists of 20 bundles and these ones need to be started first and then these ones, and you can paralyze some of them, but not all of them. So there's something called start order, but the start level on the OCI bundle level is kind of orthogonal to this. So you can install a subsystem when your default start level is 10, in which case all of the bundles will get start level 10, even though the individual ones inside the subsystem need a slightly different order. As far as I know, Cara feature files can be generated from a Maven dependency list. You can have a list of dependencies and turn it into, I think it's the car Maven plugin or something like that. Turn that into a, a car file. Now you can use that same dependency list with this Maven plugin that I had up there with the sausage making. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can have the same dependency list, but then with a different Maven plugin and that should spit out an ESA file. So I haven't tried this, but I think in theory it should be as just a matter of changing the Maven plugin. Mm -hmm. 
Right. We are not in direct control of, of, of the those features. Right, but they, that's okay. So that's a good question, and it might be something for the mailing lists in Caraf. But as far as I know, they all have a POM somewhere. Okay. Right. So in in the respective projects, they have a POM where this car file is generated. And what you could do is you create another POM, which is a copy, but then uses a different Maven plugin to spit out an ESA file instead. Okay. Thanks. Okay. One last question. Are we done? Take me for coffee. Okay. <laughs>